Good morning, church. Glad to see you here today, and there's a, it's a full house today. There's a lot of people here. Glad to see you, and glad to have you that are at home uh, worshiping with us, and um, hope you are blessed uh, today as well. It's been a great weekend. Uh, some amazing things have happened. Some people's uh, relationships went up a level. You can look at Facebook for that and leave your appropriate comments. Um, that's always good, and we're happy for that. I'll say no more. But really, really good thing yesterday is we have a new sister in Christ. Uh, Ava Branstetter was baptized yesterday, and Ava, if you'll stand up. There she is. There's a new sister in Christ, and uh, be sure to uh, congratulate her, welcome her into the family. Thank you, Ava. And uh, it was an exciting day, and uh, I'll share with you just a little bit, um, because I I think it's really important. And I said it yesterday uh, when she was being baptized, but I asked her, you know, sometimes we talk about that, and what leads you to this point? Why'd you make this decision right now? And she'd been studying with Sharon Austin, and that's a pretty good reason, because Sharon's a fantastic teacher, and has helped a lot of people learn how to make that decision. Uh, Another thing that was uh, pretty helpful in the situation is they had gone to the Challenge Youth Conference the previous weekend, and she said there was a song lyric, and this really struck me, and I said it yesterday, and I'll say it today, because I think a lot of times when we sing these songs, we get caught up in whether it's our favorite song, or the melody, or how well someone's singing, but what she pointed out was a specific lyric, and this lyric was, it was uh, Does He Still Feel the Nails, was the song. And there was a lyric in there that really struck her and hit her. And I love that aspect of it because it's the truth that's in these songs, the lyrics that are the real thrust of it. And here was a situation and where it impacted her and was one more element of many that helped her to make the decision, the best decision you can possibly make. And so that's an encouragement. And so, Ava, we welcome you into the church family. You're a new sister in Christ, and um, you're an amazing young lady, and look forward to uh, how you're going to grow in your faith and and what you'll do in service to the Lord. That's a reason to celebrate, so be sure to to encourage her after services are over. It's a great day. Weather's good. Feels like spring's right around the corner. Our winter wasn't too strong, not too strong. We had a few cold days, not a ton of snow, maybe next year. Or, you know, it's Indiana, so maybe next month we'll get that as well. We can pray. We can pray. <laughs> Some of you are shaking your fist. Shut up. Um, belonging with, belonging with. We're going into a new phase of it. We've been talking about what does life mean with Jesus first? We look pretty broad. And there's three things we focused on last month as we were talking about Jesus first and what does it look like? What does life mean with Jesus first? And those three big things we talked about was a place to belong. We talked about identity and we talked about purpose. We're now going to dive in a little bit more on these things and talk about, well, we've got those concepts, but how does that function? In a real way, how does that function? We can understand that's a thing we need to do, but how does it actually function? And what do we take away from the Bible, and how do we employ these in our own lives for ourselves, but how do we do that for other people as well? If you would, let's start in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, because 1 John 1, I love John tremendously. I mean, he is just such a, a, a loving guy, and he really truly cares about the congregations he's working with, and this is near the end of his life. And I love that aspect that he never quit. Man, he just goes for it. And, and from the beginning of his service to God when he was uh, a young man of whatever age he was, I personally think he was probably pretty young and following Jesus, to even this point when he's writing these letters to the churches in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and even Revelation, which is at the end of the first century, the guy is just going for it. And you can see pouring out of him is his love and his care for the church. It means everything. It means everything. And when he's writing this at the beginning, uh, he's given some big concepts to them. And I love this is what he does in uh, chapter 1, verse 7 of 1 John. Well, actually, let's start in verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him. So he was with Jesus, and he's heard this message from Jesus. And we're going to declare it to you. These churches, these people that he cares about. That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with him, and we walk in darkness, we lie. And we don't practice the truth. But if we walk, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Five, six, and seven, three verses, huge statement there, especially in the context of belonging. 
belonging. If we walk in the light, if we choose to belong with God, that's a big deal. God is allowing us to make that choice, but there's a sense that he's getting here that they're Christians, they've made this choice, that there's a natural element that we should belong with God, but there's a choice involved in it. If you choose to walk in darkness, you're rejecting God and separating yourself in that regard. But if you choose to walk in the light, you can be with God. But more on top of that, it defines you be together. There is a sense of belonging with inherent in this, first with God and then with one another. It's really, really important. You know, we have a yearning, all of us, to belong in some capacity. You ever think about things that you did, efforts that you made to belong with certain groups of people at some point? Now, some of us may have went through a phase where we're like, no, man, I'm a nonconformist. I don't have to do anything. Eh, it's all crazy. All those people dress exactly the same. I'm saying that because I was one of those people. Your black boots, your black pants, and your punk rock haircut. I'm so different. No, you look like everybody else who's off to the side, <laughs> whatever. You ever think of the things that you did? whether it was getting the cool pair of tennis shoes, the right t-shirts, and really in that sense of belonging, you're trying to fit in, and you're hoping people see you as the same kind, and you, you can connect with people on some level. Maybe it's you let people know what entertainment you're into, your favorite sports team, or that you just like this thing, and you can kind of even be friends but argue over one person likes one team and one likes the other. That's fun. Maybe it's a shared hobby, but people put effort into fitting in belonging together. We yearn for it. You ever remember what it's like to go into the lunchroom in middle school? What table can I sit at? Where do I belong? Now, some schools, that's bigger than others. There's a hierarchy to it. And frankly, some just don't care as much. But there's a sense of belonging. I think about in college, I had some uh, really good friends. Uh, but even before I got to college and the idea of friends... This is Dan Patterson and Craig Watkins. Dan's the one on the left. This is a little bit later. They were adventuresome and you were traveling. I think they're in Niger in this uh, picture. Dan loved going to Africa. And when I was a senior in high school and a little bit before, I would go to UK once a week. I was mentoring under a professor. And I was a high school kid, but it was really cool going to UK's campus and walking around and doing my work. No one paid attention to me because I was a kid, a high school kid. And it was really obvious because I wore my Powell County High School academic team jacket, which was so cool. It was the coolest. Black satin with all my patches from tournaments all over it and said Rogers across the back. The pinnacle uh, of cool. I go that one day and I'm like, hey, I've got time to meet uh, my buddy Daxon. And I know he's got friends. He was a year ahead of me, already established at school. And I'm just excited. Well, yeah, I'll get to have lunch with them. Because usually I just talk to professors, wandered around and went home. And then Dan's there. Uh, Daxon's there with one of her friends, Dan. And Dan is the best. Because the sense of belonging with, man, Dan got that. Now, he came from Louisville. I come from Eastern Kentucky. He went to a massive school. I went to a tiny school. You can make a huge list of the reasons we would be separate. Dan didn't worry about those things. He didn't notice the one thing, though. I went up to meet him and said, hey, Dan, how you doing? He's like, Dave, I've heard about you. Nice jacket. <laughs> there was a hit to it, man. He was acknowledging, I like you, but man, you don't do that here but I like you. And I was like, what are you talking about, Dan? <laughs> it's a cool jacket. But he was the best. And even when I went to school there the next year, he was there at the forefront. You can sit at my table. And you're included. And our friend group grew. And, and it was awesome. But there was a sense of belonging. And putting aside the things that really didn't matter. I mean, I needed to adjust. But, of course, moving into college is a little bit different. But I'll never forget the effort that was put into including and making sure that people were sure that they belong, that they were a part of. And it really hit me, the effort that was made. And that's just a young person doing that. And even still today, if I call up Dan, hey man, how you doing? I'm going to come over or get lunch. No doubt he would be like, of course, of course, of course. That's beautiful. That's the way it should be in life. Especially in the church. When you take this and transition over to the idea of the church and belonging with, 
And we're mindful of the fact that there's so many people out there in the world that they yearn to belong, but sometimes they don't know. Sometimes they come up with a series of reasons of why they might not be accepted in a church building. You ever talk to someone that thought that way? Maybe they think they don't have the right clothes, or maybe they think they don't have the right background, or maybe they think they don't know enough about the Bible, and they get into that pattern of reasons why they might not belong. And all the time we're thinking, but you do, but you do, but you do. The question is, do we put forth the effort to make sure they know? Are we reaching out? Are we being sure that people understand that they belong with God? They belong with us. It was a great thing that Dan did, Craig did too. The whole idea was you belong to, even in a social situation at a university, that element of two also, we're here and you should be here too, is stunning. It's striking. Even today in this audience, even someone watching at home may be wondering, do I belong? Do I belong? People that did an amazing example of this and making sure that people knew they belong exemplified this was Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila. Now, you may know who they are exactly, and we'll be there in Acts 18 in just a moment, but they are not what you would call like major, major, major Bible Characters. However, the things that they did were major, especially in the sense that they helped people understand you belong here with us. And they are quite instructive in the way that we can follow their example. And if we're wondering, well, how do I include people and how do I give people a sense of belonging? They're a fine example. I mean, an excellent example. Go with me over to Acts chapter 18 to their first appearance. We've got them in a controversial situation, and no fault of their own, of course, in Acts chapter 18. There's a decree that's been made uh, by the Roman government, and that decree meant that all the Jews needed to leave Rome, and so they've, they've left Rome where they existed before. And we're going to find them in Corinth, so they've transplanted themselves here. So in chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, this is where we're first going to be introduced to Priscilla and Aquila. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, which I think is northeast Turkey, modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor then, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Now, they would not be allowed to go back until about 54 A.D. That's not just a biblical thing. You can read about that historically. as The Romans kept really good records. And he came to them. So Paul is going to Priscilla and Aquila. So, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation, they were tent makers. So, Paul's traveling about. We know that he's deep into his missionary journeys at this point. We also know that he's reaching out to a broad, broad scope of people, not just the Jewish people, but the Gentile people as well. And that'll come into play with Priscilla and Aquila. We have hints of that for sure. And and so, he's setting up with them, and he's finding a connection because they are believers. They're also tent makers, And that's enough. That's all they needed. There was a sense that we belong together, and we're going to be together, and we're going to choose to include one another. You might say, well, I mean, he's he's the apostle Paul, man. Of course they're going to welcome him in. Yeah, but the apostle Paul came with a lot of baggage and a lot of controversy. At that time, things were stirred up. But these people didn't worry about that. They'd come out of controversy. They were kicked out of their home simply because of their their heritage by the Roman government. They understand that. So it's a little bit deeper connection that they have. And they're willing to come together and say, let's do the things of God together. We belong together in that alone. And so they did. And they worked together and they taught together and things were really good. In fact, if you read a little bit further down in chapter 18, starting uh, in verse 18, Paul remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. They belonged enough together that they're going to travel with them. They've already been uprooted from Rome, and now they're going to travel with him towards uh, Ephesus is where they're going to go. And he had his hair cut off at Sincrea, and he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogues and reasoned with the Jews. Now, they set up shop in Ephesus for a while. This is the work they're going to do. But they're still looking for people that they belong with and that belong with them. 
that belong with God and belong with them. It's, it seems like it's deep in them at this point. The next part unfolds, still in the same chapter, is they encounter like this really zealous young man named Apollos. And in verse 24, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, which is a, a very happening place, a, a real cultural epicenter, and a lot of academic work was done in Alexandria. An eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren, exhorting the disciples to receive him, they wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. In terms of belonging with, when they came to Ephesus, they didn't separate themselves. They went to work immediately. At this time, the Christians were going to the synagogues because, well, that's where the people that had an interest in God were going to meet anyway. Now, there may have been those of a Jewish background meeting there, but that's where the discussions could happen. And that's where it could be taught about Jesus being the Christ, the Messiah is here. And converts could be made from that situation. And this is where they encounter Apollos. But it's very much a sense of you belong together. We belong with people and we're going to include them. And even though he was teaching powerfully and eloquently and very skilled, he was lacking a little bit. So they pull him aside, still with that idea that we belong together. We all belong with God, but we got to help each other out in the midst of this. It'd been very easy for them to point us and say, ah, you ain't got that right. Baptism of John? Is that all you got? You're not like us. It'd been easy for them to find a reason to, to separate. You're from Alexandria? You're not our background. You speak like that? That's a little different. Not like us. It'd been easy for them to do that. Many people have that temptation today to find the reasons not to connect. But not them. Not this godly couple. They find the reasons to make the connections, and then they make them even stronger. They're exemplifying what it means to belong with. And even now, that should stir up in every single one of us. Wait a minute. Am I doing that? How well am I doing that? Can I do that better? Can I do that better? It doesn't stop with them even here at this point. This is an amazing first appearance. Acts chapter 18. You go over Romans chapter 16, and Paul's going to be writing about them in verses 3 and 4 and 5. And there are some incredible details that we find out about them here. Now, some people believe that here in Romans chapter 16, as he's given this pretty unique ending to his letters in which he's uh, listing a lot of Christians. You all know I love this chapter a lot because it shows all the people that are involved in the Christian community. There's a very sen strong sense of belonging with this. And he is given accolades, but he's also instructing the church at Rome to engage with and, and have a sense of belonging with these people. Priscilla and Aquila in this section kind of get the longest, longest uh, note from him. Verse 3, he's telling the people in the church at Rome, greet, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Now we see Paul is saying they belong in the works that I've been given. We all belong together. Greet them. Greet them. Verse 4, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Three verses. Man, we get a bit of information, don't we? These people were not passive Christians. These were not people that were just kind of coasting through, hoping it all works out. They understood what it means. We belong with God. We belong together, which means we're going to go out and we're going to engage the world around us. We're not going to wait for it to happen. They risk their necks. We understand that language. They're willing to put themselves on the line for the benefit of others because the work of God is that important. They risk their necks. And not only Paul gave things to them, but all the churches of the Gentiles Maybe that's because they supported him and his works in that too. 
But in addition, how much effort did they put for all the churches? They understood this isn't a story about us pulling ourselves back and, and just living a life by ourselves. But every single Christian matters. The entire work of God matters. And with whatever capacity he's given them, and it seems they have quite a bit, they're going to use it. They're going to use it because we belong with God and we belong together. Even to the degree that they hosted a congregation in their own house. Can you imagine what that would take? It's an easy phrase to say, isn't it? Well, I would just host the church in my house. I mean, yeah, every once in a while, maybe. Can you think about what effort that would take? How much cleaning do you do to prep for one guest, two guests, right? And some of you may go, none. They're just going to have to deal with it. Okay. Well, what about every week all the Christians come together and meet at your house? Historians suggest that even if they were quite wealthy, and there's reasons to believe they did have funds that other people might not, they did travel pretty freely. Of course, their business would allow them to set up shop and perhaps do that. But even if they did have a rather exceptional dwelling place, you could host maybe 60, 70 people, maybe. Can you imagine that every single week, the effort it would take to prepare for 60 or 70 people? Because you knew how important it was for people to belong with God, to worship God, but you also belong together. So whatever resources they have available to them, they're giving to that effort. They understood what it means to belong with, and they were making the effort. The other two passages, 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Timothy 4, it's another uh, element of greeting them and making note of them, but it shows depth. It shows depth. In Corinthians, where they first met in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Priscilla and Aquila, he is sending his greetings from them to the church in Corinth, which was really important as Corinth was going through a lot of difficulties. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he's instructing Timothy to be sure to go by and visit their house um, and those there, which is interesting um, in and of itself. But it shows that these people were deeply involved in the church. Well, that's great. And that would be interesting in and of itself and simple for us to say, well, that's some interesting facts and good for them. But the question that we engage in today is, how do I do that? How do I do this? With people, with God, with people, and continue that on. They initially wanted to be with people because that's how you evangelize and that's how you edify and that's how you build up. So they're with people. But the force behind that was the fact that they wanted people to be with God as they were. And so when people would convert and become Christians, that was a win for the kingdom of God. And they were going to do their efforts in that. But they wouldn't let it go of that. They would continue being with people. They would continue so they could build them up and teach them and instruct them more accurately and encourage all the churches. And then they would continue being with people to lead them come to Christ. And there was this circle that's unfolding there, and it was their life, the fullness of their life. And again, that should be something that strikes us. I can do that. I can do that. Yes, you can do that. Yes, you absolutely can do that. And we must do that. Because there are people yearning today for a place to belong. There's people looking for a place to belong. And the world is offering them so many options that aren't godly, that aren't healthy for their souls. They may look good for a moment, but it's going to end really bad. You can see it coming. The world's going to offer a, a place of greed, a, a selfish ambition, the world's going to make them look out for themselves and give them a thing where like, okay, I kind of feel fulfilled in this, but it will all fail. Only God is eternal and only God's ways are eternal and only God's ways are absolute truth and only God's ways are a life that leads to him and fulfillment and all the things that we could ever need to truly, truly belong. And if I know that that other part's out there in the world and I can do something about it, you can do something about it. And there's people looking for a place. How can we not look for a way to let people know that they belong with God and they belong with his people in the church? They absolutely belong. So how do we do that? They created space for people to belong with them. How do we do that today? First, let's start with God's perspective on belonging. 
You ever think about that? God's perspective on belonging? I know, God's big. Even the idea of God is massive, and it's hard to think of that. And how do you associate with that? But God is so big that he cares even about the minute details in life. We wrestle with that sometimes. How could he even care about me or what's going on in this moment in my life when there's almost 8 billion people on the earth and all the other things that are going on in the universe? But God is so big and God is so great and God is so perfect in his love that he does care about each and every individual. And right now, whatever you're going through, whether great and triumphant or dismal and and, and horrifying and you don't know how you're going to get through it, God cares about you in that moment and you belong with him. In the midst of the darkness, you belong with him. In the midst of the trouble, you belong with him because he's going to see you through it. In the midst of the triumphs, you belong with him because he gave them to you and he wants you to abound in those things. Just consider if you bookend life from the very beginning, how does God view belonging? Even at the beginning, we have this idea. Acts chapter 17, verse 26, Paul's in Athens and he's teaching there and he's giving these details about God and he's pointing out creation, the idea of creation, where we come from. And in this is very strongly God's perspective in belonging for mankind. He makes this one statement, and he has made from one blood every nation of men. That's common ground. Belonging. From one, he has made, opens it up, we have in common a singular creator. You are not an accident. You didn't come out of nothing. You came because God created mankind with intent and purpose and with his glory and in his image. It's no small thing. And every single human has that. This is God's perspective on belonging. He made you. He made you. We need to soak that in and internalize that a little bit. You are not an accident. You are not an accident. You were created by the almighty God. And he wants you to be with him, with him. And on top of that, you were created from one blood, every nation of men. Whatever effort we put into the idea of how different we are and how separate we should be from all the other people around us in life for for wild reasons, because they were born in some other geography that they didn't even choose, they just were born there, so we can't be around them. Or someone was born with a different color of skin, so we can't be around them. Or they speak a different language, so we can't be around them. Man, we separate pretty easy on on those elements. But that's not God's perspective. He created all of us from one blood. Some translations say from one man. And his idea was that we all come together in the light, in the light and following him. So instead of pursuing why not to come together, from a God perspective, we must pursue how we do come together, why we should come together, why we must come together. Back to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. That is what he desires for us. Here, absolutely here on earth, but imagine the afterlife. Imagine the afterlife. Some of those things that we take as reasons to separate, let them go, because they don't exist in heaven. Whether you're an American or from North Korea, or whether you're from Canada, or France, or whether you're from wherever, those distinctions do not exist in heaven. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Culturally, whether you're from the city and view yourself as quite sophisticated, or whether you're from the country and you like things a little easy, irrelevant in heaven. Irrelevant. And when you think of all the people that you're like, I don't want to be around them, and maybe a temptation to think that they're less than you in some way. Drop that, because in heaven, irrelevant. In fact, unacceptable. Unacceptable. God's intention was for us to belong with him and to belong together. And if I'm going to be God's person and you're going to be God's person, then I need to have a God perspective. 
If you go back from that scripture reading that Will read for us uh, at the beginning in Romans, uh, the idea was that he's Lord over everyone. And if, if Jesus is my Lord, then I'm going to have the same perspective he has. And if I don't, I need to change it and get there. I got to change it and get there. And I got to look at life the way he does. And for those people that choose to walk in darkness, that's their choice. But man, my heart hurts for them. And the door is still going to be open to make the choice to come and walk in the light because that's what we need to do to be with God and obey the gospel. And so even if they're quite wicked and they're quite evil and you're like, I got to stay away. But if they have the slightest interest in the light, let's talk about that. Let's find that connection to bring them into the light and show them that path. And if they're just asking questions about it, yeah, we'll talk about it. And if they want to step into it, absolutely, absolutely, to be together with God, to be together with one another, that's God's perspective. So if we start there, we've got the right beginning. And if you've got the right beginning, you're heading in the right direction. And that's what we want to do. It's what Priscilla and Aquila did. The blood of Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Man, that's the best moment. That's the best moment. Remember who taught you how to become a Christian? And they thought you were of such value that you belong with them and belong with God. It's something we need to give to the people around us as well. The second thing, once we got that perspective of God and the way that we reach out for the people around us, is man, Priscilla and Aquila, they put the effort in, didn't they? This wasn't just a thing they kind of hoped might happen. They put the effort in. When they left Rome, they could have set themselves like, man, our life is so miserable. We got kicked out of our home. I guess we'll go to Corinth and sit and mope and feel sorry for themselves. No. They got busy and got connected with the other Christians, the people they belong with, and they got doing the work of God, who they ultimately belong with. They looked for ways to get involved. They would go to the synagogue when they got to Ephesus looking for people to belong with and to people who could belong with God. And even in that moment they came with Apollos, they're making the effort to go to him and encourage him. They're putting in the effort. They're not sitting back and waiting for someone else to do it and take care of it. They're getting involved to the best of their abilities, who they can share life with, who they can share the gospel with, who they can share God with. It's not a passive behavior for them nor for us. None of us gets to say, I would love to go talk to that person, but somebody else will get it. I would love to do that, but I'm sure someone else can take care of that. I've got better things to do. <gasps> better things to do. We may not verbalize it that way, but do our actions communicate that? I hope not. We've got to have that perspective that God has, and then we've got to go look for people to share with, put in the effort. And you may say, man, I'm not really, really great at direct contact with people. That's okay. Start with where you are comfortable, a letter, a phone call, a text, an email, a hello, a how you doing, or go to someone who is really good at it and go with them. It can be a team effort. It can absolutely be a team effort. There's someone sitting here today and there's someone sitting at home waiting to be recognized, waiting to be told they belong, waiting to be encouraged. You can make the difference. One person can't do that by themselves. A congregation of people absolutely can. And if we set apart the reasons why we shouldn't go talk to somebody... I don't know, they dress funny, or I, I don't go to that side of the auditorium, or, or I, 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 I don't want to inconvenience them. How are you going to inconvenience someone by making them feel extra, extra welcome, okay? If they're put off by that, okay, but you did your best in that, and that's, that's fantastic. You can start with that. It's that idea of including people too. You belong to. People yearn for that. You're in a position to help them be fulfilled in that in the Lord. It is absolutely loving your neighbor as yourself. That verse doesn't have to be an abstract concept where we know we're supposed to do it. You can put that into action by reaching out to people and letting them know you belong with us too in the light. Last one is make this normal. Make this normal and good. Belonging is normal and good. 
Sometimes we feel like, okay, well, this is going to be an exceptional event to make that happen. It should never be just an exceptional event. This should be our normal behavior. Do you remember way back, I'll switch stories here a little bit, go to the Old Testament, but just to show you as an example, David was considered a man after God's own heart. 2 Samuel chapter 9, I'll make this pretty quick. There was a situation where Daniel, uh, not Daniel, but David was king, and he's looking at, and is there anybody of the house of Saul that I can show kindness to? Now, that would be a striking statement because that was the previous king, of course. And that was the previous king who had tried to kill David on multiple occasions. Well, he has passed away at this point. And his son, Jonathan, had passed away at this point. And David, being a man after God's own heart, having a sense of perspective of belonging, says, is there anybody of his house I can show kindness to? He's putting in the effort. So he sends people to find out. And lo and behold, 2 Samuel chapter 9, Jonathan has a son, Mephibosheth, still alive. He's lame, but still alive. And David extends a great kindness to him. It might have been shocking to the people around. It might have been really shocking because he says, bring him. And not only does he restore his grandfather's land to him, amazing, because this was the enemy, the grandson of the enemy, but not the enemy, but kind of the enemy. He was treated so poorly, he could find reasons to separate him from him. Really, your grandfather tried to kill me. Get away with you. Nope. You belong. You belong. You are the son of my best friend. You belong. And he went even further. You belong at my table. Can you imagine? All these people, like, they might have been whispering and gossiping and whatnot. But the man after God's own heart says, you will sit at my table. Now, buddy, if you're, if you're going to let someone know they belong, you're inviting them to the table. And you get to sit with them on a regular basis. You get to sit and you eat. I don't know what it is. It's not magic, but there's something really special about sitting and sharing a meal with someone. And if you invite someone to your table, you are letting them know you belong here with me in this moment, kind of an intimate moment, and where there's going to be a conversation and there's going to be a talk, but you matter a massive amount to me. And the people could have said, but, but he's, he's the grandson of Saul, but he has no value to you. In fact, he's lame and, and he's not going to do anything. But David says, is there anyone of the house of Saul that I can show a kindness to that they belong? They belong with me. He was trying to explain this should be the normal behavior because it's good and it's right and it's kind. Not the exceptional, normal Sometimes I wonder what we make normal. You know, that's a choice. It really is. We could have an event once a year. I will invite someone I don't know to come eat. Yeah, you could do that, but that's setting aside an exceptional day. Okay. But what if it was your normal? And what would the example be if that was your normal? And how much easier would it be for people to feel like they belong if that was your normal? where you're putting forth the effort to show God's perspective that people absolutely belong. Well, sitting at the table is just one way it can happen. There's a million other ways. Hey, you want to go watch a movie with me? Do you want to go see a show? Or in fact, what can we do together? I don't know your interest, but I'm willing to set mine aside to spend time with you because it's important that Christians belong together. That should be our normal. It should be our good. I hope those three things are things that you recognize that you can absolutely do. And even if you are doing them, it's a fair question. Say, you know, don't pat myself on the back, but how do I do it better? How do we bring more people in? Because that's what Aquila and Priscilla did. They kept going, man. They kept going. And they kept growing in the midst of it. With all the churches of the Gentiles owed them thanks. To whether they were in Rome or to whether they were in Ephesus, to whether they were in Corinth or whether they were wherever they were in the world, they were helping people see that they belong. That can be us if we choose it. And that should be our normal and our good. I hope you grab a hold of that and you're like, yeah, I can do something and I can do it today. Before you even leave this building, you can make a choice to do that. And I hope you do. Someone needs it. Someone yearns for it. And you can make the difference to connect them with God. You belong with God. You belong together. Today, if there's a way that we can encourage you and lift you up. If there's a way that we can help you come closer to God, we want to do it. We absolutely want to do it. Your soul is precious. You matter. 
We all were created by the same God, and we want to be with the same God in heaven. If you have any questions about that, you want to know how you fit into that, you want to know what it means to walk in the light, to even have a moment of prayer, to know that you belong with God in His church, please, please let us know. Decide to be with God. If there's a way we can serve you in that regard, let us know as we stand and as we sing.